the IQAC and Research Consultancy Cell of Vimla College. It is great pleasure in welcoming each one of you to the inaugural session of Exploring It, the research webinar series that has been envisioned uh, as, a as a venue, a platform that will give rise to a wide range of ideas, that will give you uh, a route map about how to carry on with research across the disciplines of science, social sciences, and humanities. We begin with the session, Contemporary Issues in Research, which will be handled by respected Dr. K.M. Sheriff, Associate Professor and Head, Department of English, University of Calicut. The word explorigate is a play on the words explore and investigate, as the brochure suggested. Without further ado, and invoking the blessings of the Almighty, we begin with the webinar series. I call upon our respected principal, Dr. Sister Bina Jos, to welcome this August gathering online. Sister. Commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. Respected dignitaries, Dr. K.M. Sharif, Associate Professor, and Head of the Department of English, University of Calicut, Dr. Minimal K. Jose, Vice Principal and IQSC Coordinator of Vimla College, members of the IQSC and Research Consultancy Cell, participants from various institutions, dear colleagues and my dear students. At the outset, I would like to congratulate the members of the IQSC and Research Consultancy Cell of Vimla College for organizing such a wonderful research webinar series, Explorigate. Explorigate blends two words, explore and investigate. Both are central to research. I'm sure that uh, this webinar series will cover the nuances of research in sciences, social sciences, and humanities. It will encourage the exchange of knowledge among diverse disciplines. The eminent resource persons across the globe will add and color, to, and, color and luster to this webinar series. Research is a journey through a dark tunnel, but at the end, we will see light. As you know, time, patience, and perseverance will accomplish all things. Albert Einstein said, I have tried 99 times, but have failed. But at the end, but the hundredth time came success. Yes, the habit of persistence is the habit of victory. Excellence is not being the best, but doing your best. So let us try to do our level best and try to excel in our lives. Dear participants, I'm sure that your presence will certainly make this webinar fruitful and productive. We have with us today Dr. Kaim Sharif, the head of the Department of English, University of Calicut, to inaugurate this webinar series and to give a lecture on contemporary issues in research. Thank you, sir, for accepting our invitation to be the part of this webinar series. Once again, I congratulate the IQSC and Research Consultancy Cell of Vimla College for organizing this program, and I wish all the success to this webinar series. I welcome all of you to this gathering. Thank you. Thank you, respected uh, sister. May I now call upon Dr. Nisha Francis Alipart, head of the Department of English, to introduce the resource person for the day. Ma'am. Nisha, ma'am. We're looking forward to a little bit of technical glitches because we've just very quickly jumped onto the online and technical mode. Hello, Nishaman. Maya, she got some technical issues, Maya. No, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Some providers have a problem. Uh, mm. they, they go off and on. So that's why. That's true. That's true. The probably and, should uh, come up quickly. I think uh, we'll have to deviate from the conventional order of uh, the program. And uh, we can begin with your session, sir. And then uh, probably when the technical uh, uh, glitches are done, maybe uh, at the end of your session. Uh, we'll be able to give you a rather 
detailed introduction. Would that be all right, sir? It's not very necessary, anyway. <laughs> I, can, <laughs> I can simply tell you something about messenger. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. So, so I hand over I, the. Shall yes, I? sir. Yes, sir. Please, sir. Please, sir. Okay. Welcome Good to morning. our webinar. Uh, yes. Sir. The sister Bina Jos, the principal of the college, Dr. Sister Bina Jos, uh, the coordinator of the IQAC Vimala College, uh, teachers, the sir scholars, uh, everybody else. Uh, were, join this session. So uh, this is, I'm afraid, not a very scholarly lecture. And uh, probably scholarly lectures normally uh, do not work when you are talking about research. So yeah, this is basically uh, I am talking to you as a researcher. I started research in 80, 87, 1987. Uh, as a research supervisor, which I have been for the last uh, 20 or odd years. So uh, this is uh, my experience, uh, definitely uh, some reading, uh, my experience as a researcher, and all the sundry things I have gathered on the way as a teacher. I've been teaching for the last 32 years. So uh, my area is basically translation studies. Uh, I do a bit of uh, pedagogy, language teaching, and uh, of course, linguistics. So uh, this is, uh, I'll speak for about an hour, roughly an hour, and then uh, leave the session open for uh, interaction, which probably you can half an hour, or even more, I don't mind if there are questions. You can uh, ask the questions directly, or you can type it in the chat box. I'll go through those questions and respond to them. Um, I can't assure you that I'll give. Uh, I can give very uh, effective answers or responses. But definitely, I'll try. So, uh, I, as of now, I have a secure connection. But even if it breaks off, don't worry. I have a parallel connection set up. So I'll be rejoining if something happens in the middle. Okay. So uh, let me begin. So let me first talk about the sources of research. All of you have uh, looked that up. What kind of sources are they uh, which you can use for research? OK, there is a conventional division between uh, primary sources and secondary sources. Everybody knows that. OK, so for instance, a novel can be a primary source. OK. And a critique, even a review of this uh, novel can be secondary. So this division between primary and secondary. And there are, of course, in between cases. Okay, Like, uh, for instance, an autobiography, for instance, which uh, in, depending upon what you choose, you can call a primary source or uh, a secondary source. A novel, for instance, can also become a secondary source sometimes. Okay, when you when you are investigating a particular historical period, for example, the novel might become a secondary source because you'll find something in the novel which connects you to your research. Yeah, that often happens. Uh, Marx said very famously that uh, it is in Balzac's uh, fiction the 19th century French writer Balzac's fiction, uh, that you get more about the history of France between 1818 and 1848. And it's a famous statement they made, than from uh, the works of official historians. OK, so primary uh, secondary sources, depending upon uh, what your research topic or research area is. OK, now there is a tertiary source. Probably, I don't know if you have uh, discussed that in your research or in your research conversations, in research forums. A tertiary source is simply an index of primary and secondary uh, sources. For, for instance, an encyclopedia, okay, a bibliography. Index, uh, indices which give you information about what uh, books are available on a particular topic. So if, if this tertiary source is very important because if, if it is exhaustive, 
think of a, a tertiary source like malayala grantha sojika kem govi uh, he died uh, recently so kem govi's malayala grantha sojika will tell you uh, in uh, several uh, i mean sections there are, it's, it's well classified so you have a section on translation for example which uh, again it is further divided into translation from different languages genres genres like uh, uh, fiction poetry drama so if you look that up uh, uh, very exhaustively you'll find uh, if you are doing research on let us say fiction in malayalam if you are doing research on translations into malayalam in a particular period of time you'll find all the uh, available uh, information or there are there are things which are outside the uh, which which you can't find in the uh, index but uh, nevertheless the index as such is a good source of information so so i am just wondering how much of uh, tertiary uh, materials you are using tertiary sources tertiary sources are very important now uh, this is what i was uh, thinking right at the beginning okay uh, suppose your sources are not uh, in quotes authentic not uh, let us say uh, officially recognized all these words have to be uh, given in quotes okay suppose it is just an oral text okay so let us say you are investigating uh, folklore in malayalam okay and uh, you uh, come across a song okay you hear it from uh, a, an old woman okay the granny she sings this song and you are investigating you are an investigator in folklore okay so what do you do you uh, now you have a recorder you can record record a song on your mobile uh, recorder okay so this song i heard long ago okay uh, i'll um, sing that song although in a very bad voice ali pokere avile chakkara avada vekkada maduram nokkatte this i heard from my grandmother okay my grandmother would have heard it from somebody else okay so 1 2 3 4 i sang it to a niece of mine okay she is now 26 years old she has a small daughter and i sang the same song to her daughter now look at the number of generations six generations orally transmitted okay so what is your source what is your source for uh, this particular song okay you, you, your source is just this oral uh, recap recapitulation memory okay you record it and you have uh, you you can use this as evidence that's what i'm trying to say it's not printed anywhere you don't find this printed anywhere okay it's it's just uh, in the repertoire of uh, communal memory okay or uh, political unconscious or whatever you want to call it social unconscious so this but this can be used as a source that's my point okay very well you can you can record the song you can conduct a, an interview you can you can use this video as a source this is authentic this is acceptable that's what i'm trying to say although not uh, recognized as such by many people but it's useful okay think of uh, a, a, a private investigation i conducted on uh, the road which is a very broad road which passes uh, in front of my home in kolikod so this is once a very small one foot track okay so not very long ago let us say some 70 years ago okay so it's grown into this uh, the road and i have a person living in my neighborhood who saw everything happening how this one foot track was converted first into a uh, mud road uh, not very broad uh, for uh, this this one foot track was submerged in water for most of the monsoon so people uh, especially women working in the cashew factory pierce lesley cashew factory in uh, karapuram which is in my neighborhood so uh, it it was primarily for them that this was converted into a mud road low way back let us say in the 1940s 
Okay, so this person living in my neighborhood can give a very authentic account of this. How this happened? What are the social forces at work? Okay, all kinds of uh, political formations: the Communist Party, the Indian National Congress, uh, both uh, parties being strong in this area. How they set about doing it? How volunteers appeared on the scene? So every, all these accounts are from a single person. Okay, so I record this. Okay, I can use this as evidence. I can use this as material for my research. So these are unconventional sources that you can use, that you get in uh, very commonly in languages and social sciences. The existence of a particular expression in Malayalam or Tamil or Kannada, any any language which is spoken in the area where you live, where you, where you work. Okay, so these unconventional records are these unconventional sources are now acceptable in research. Okay, so these sources, these unconventional sources, are acceptable in research and they are widely used. As far as I am aware, this is the first uh, idea I wanted to share with you. Okay, now, uh, yeah. Even if your sources are not reliable, if, if, you, if you have a doubt about your source, you can simply mention that in your uh, writing. When you're writing the thesis, you can say, so these are the sources from which I have collected the material. And, and some of these sources are, do not appear to be reliable for the following reasons. Okay. So the, I, the ideal thing in all these uh, gathering uh, information from sources, material from sources, and presenting them is this honesty that you carry throughout in your research. Say what you find. Say what you think about things you find. Okay, With uh, evidence. You, you can offer offhand remarks saying that these are unreliable. But why are they unreliable? Okay. So if it is from a very old person, the account is from a very old person, it would be unreliable for the simple reason that uh, the she or he might suffer from a fading memory. It's quite common. So you say that it's not very reliable. And if you, if you have evidence like this, you try to corroborate this from other sources, such as about this road. You get information from somebody like a watchman who worked in one of the cashew factories, very old but who have some faint recollection of having been told about uh, the work on this route. This is a corroborative evidence, all right? So this is about uh, sources. Now, yeah, people often ask this question. Okay, is there a special language for writing a thesis? Okay, are you required to write uh, a thesis in the third language, third person? Uh, meaning, you can't uh, ever say, I found this uh, evidence to be unreliable. I found uh, this source to be unreliable. I found the novel in a particular uh, repertoire in the library, etc. So I think this is simply uh, a, an outdated notion that you can't use the word I. Very, uh, quite a few people use this. Okay, in serious articles, you look up a writer like a translation scholar like Lefebvre, who frequently uh, uses uh, the first person. Okay, in in, in his path-breaking essay, uh, Beyond Interpretation or the Business of Rewriting, he, he begins the essay by saying that he has stolen the title from uh, Jonathan Culler, another, another well-known scholar. Okay, I have uh, stolen this title from Jonathan Culler. And I'm happy that many people will not recognize that I have stolen this. Very interesting thing. Okay. He sets the tone at the beginning of this essay by uh, talking in uh, the first person. So, okay, you'll say that this is an essay, a paper, not a uh, research uh, thesis, decision. But people have done that in decisions also. Look at uh, several decisions of. Uh, of uh, um, people working on uh, politi working in political sense in translation, dissertations which later appear as books. So I think this is quite a uh, silly kind of restriction. You can't use 
and uh, once uh, not long ago i came across a research scholar who worked under uh, meenakshi mukherjee the writer okay famous writer uh, so meenakshi mukherjee it seems insisted that you have to use a certain kind of elevated language i am using the word elevated little uh, of course you know ironically so what is elevated what is low what is middling all these are very relative concepts so i wouldn't say that there is a peculiar uh, language a particular language which you can use for research exclusively for research or uh, if not exclusively for research among other things so you can you can you can of course when you when you, uh, language is a social construct so when you are writing on a theme uh, you definitely use the language uh, that has been used in writing about it that way fine okay because only then your thesis will sound as if it belongs to this domain you have a you have a tradition of writing okay and but also remember that you have multiple traditions of writing when you are writing uh, on a particular topic there are various ways in which people have written about it okay literary criticism for example not everybody writes like uh, matthew arnold not everybody writes like minashi mukherjee not everybody like writes like uh, louis montrose okay not everybody uh, writes like uh, derrida or foucault you have uh, different uh, styles of writing different takes on issues so uh, i wouldn't say that uh there is a peculiar writing uh, addiction which is peculiar to uh, dissertations writing dissertations I'm, i'm primarily talking about uh, humanities and uh, uh, languages okay to with which i'm familiar but i think this is equally valid for research in science okay and for science definitely there are scholars uh, working on science topics they know that there is a very peculiar tradition of, of writing in uh, science okay probably in science it's true that you don't say you don't use i or things like that probably i'm not very sure well known writers uh, like carl sagan writing on uh, astrophysics have said things in the first person okay in one particular instance he talks about his family okay his wife who was his co-worker for some time uh, before launching on to uh, the left brain right brain split okay so uh, pop in popular sense all the time people are using uh, uh, the first person in uh, speaking about various topics so 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 I, i wouldn't insist on if if i if i were asked as a research is i wouldn't insist on uh, any particular uh, style or language as the fixed one for research I, i don't think it works i think it will it can never be accepted so so you write that's all so as we uh, talk about language we realize that it's a social phenomenon it has been used by lots of people and over a period of time uh, a commonly accepted style or a commonly accepted uh, diction develops Uh, in which because if it's a uh, social phenomenon uh, people have to converse with uh, each other and this happens only if there is a, some kind of convergence so that convergence you can definitely expect in uh, writing dissertations okay there's a, there's a over a period of time uh, a style or a diction is developed there's a large amount of overlap which you accept as a person living in society but not more than that does it mean that you can uh, you have to stick to very rigid uh, rules of style or diction in writing your thesis okay, it won't work it create unnecessary problems okay and i have seen students reworking on their dissertation this is called some reworking the dissertation uh, finding that their uh, language doesn't fit in quotes so this is this is a fundamental problem uh, which uh, research scholars have to address they have to, they have to uh, evolve a uh, style or diction and again uh, depending upon what their topic is naturally a particular uh, style and diction evolves so other than that there is no fixed style okay 
Okay, although uh, certain manuals, uh, I don't remember which uh, I have seen, uh, insist on a particular a straight jacketed style, but I don't think it will work. And here in our part of the world, I don't think uh, research supervisors insist on that. As far as I know, there might be uh, a few research supervisors who insist on uh, adopting a particular style or diction. So that's another. Now, okay. Uh, Yeah, one serious issue in uh, research. Uh, this is uh, particularly true about research in uh, languages, literature. You are doing research on literature. So when you when you are discussing uh, the works of an author, when you are discussing uh, the uh, a, a particular text which you have taken up for research, one tendency I found. Okay. Uh, in mm -hmm. in my uh, career as a research supervisor is the habit of simply reading of the plot of the novel the story of the novel so to speak and uh, uh, going on and on okay so if you if you let us say you are discussing uh the Roy's novel god of small things very uh, well read novel uh, and you go on uh, talking about what happened in Ayman, what happened in Rahel's uh, household. Okay, uh, without for a minute pausing to think how relevant this narration is to your research. In fact, one reason why people do that, why one reason why research scholars uh, go on and on about the plot of the novel is uh, to fill up the uh, pages. Okay. So they, they have this uh, fear of the thesis appearing uh, too small. Yeah, this is the question. But remember that if your if thesis lacks arguments, if you don't have anything to say, after all, you are working on uh, Arundhati Roy's uh, fiction also. So if, if in reading part of small things, you don't get something crucial, an argument for your... Uh, Dissertation, evaluate. What arguments would you uh, advance? Okay, think of uh, let us say uh, Arundhati Roy's description of Ivan, the village. Okay, many many uh, quotations have come in dissertations. So, 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 what is what does it imply? What does the uh, description, uh, a particular description, imply? The countryside, for example. The the uh, um, countryside, I mean, Bala, all those places. So, uh, is it simply veracity? Okay, or are the descriptions indicative of the mood in the novel? Of or let us say of what is going to come, impending uh, events. Uh, you can sometimes say impending disaster. So, this is one thing. So without such a purpose, a description is useless. Okay, or even the plot: what happened to uh, Rahe? Okay, what happened to Baby Kuchum? So all these details, unless uh, they somehow score a point in your argument, I don't think it's uh, of use. In any case, it certainly helps you pad up your uh, dissertation. Uh, this, by the way, is there a particular size recommended for a dissertation? As far as I'm aware, there is no size recommended. In fact, I have a creeping feeling that the smaller your dissertation is, the easier it will be for the referee to write it, right? So, uh, that's true. I've seen very bulky dissertations, 350, 400 pages. Uh, just, just to look at it is uh, frightening. Okay. So you, when you see it, you, you have a very uh, a kind of phobia. When will you finish looking at this? On the other hand, if you have a smaller business, say 200 pages roughly, okay, all included. <coughs> uh, bibliography, uh, introduction, everything put together, 
around 200 or less. So what do you do? We are feeling you can, can complete it in time. My decision was some in the middle. There were 240 pages. Okay, in uh, fairly large type, uh, 13, and uh, it didn't take much for the references. That was way back. I said I started research in 87, but I was a poor research scholar, so I left it, and then rejoined uh, eight years later, completed in. 2000, and I remember the distinctions coming back from the referees in about four months' time. Both referees. So, probably the size was a factor. Okay, I, although I wouldn't bet on it, I wouldn't like to bet on it, but size was certainly a factor. factor. Now, uh, so uh, what would be the smallest thesis? I saw this at EFLU, where I did a diploma in 1987. I, I believe it, is, it was called uh, the syntactic structure of John is easy to please. If I remember right, this was just 73 pages. So I'm trying to relocate. I searched the net yesterday, couldn't find the thesis. But of course, it would be there in EFLU now. Those who have done something uh, in F diploma, or MBIT or uh, MPhil or PhD would definitely, uh, in linguistics especially, would definitely have seen this. So you can write a manageable, uh, a very uh, useful, uh, I mean, argumentative, okay, valid uh, dissertation in just 73 pages, or let us say 100. Okay. It would have been more, a little more when it was uh, submitted as a dissertation, 100 pages. Let's say. So what does this mean? This means that size doesn't count. Even if you write a dissertation of 400 pages and uh, the referee gets irritated in going through it because there's nothing new in this. There's nothing in the dissertation which tells the referee that you have worked for your dissertation other than simply reading up text and quoting from them. I mean, <clears throat> without actually advancing any kind of argument, any kind of, uh, without solving any research question. OK, all right. So this, I think, is the crux of the matter. There's, there's no prescribed uh, size for a dissertation. Many uh, research supervisors would, of course, uh, personally on their own, advise their research scholars to write a decision uh, in such and such a number of pages. But apart from the fact that it's a personal observation, I don't think uh, it's valid in any way. Okay. So that's one thing. And and uh, we, we started off by discussing how research scholars sometimes try to increase the size of their uh, decisions by simply uh, dragging on and on, simply uh, narrating the stories. This is a common observation. It's not possible when you are talking, uh, when you are writing something on uh, criticism. We also do research on criticism. Okay. It's not possible. But even there, I have found people quoting unnecessarily. I found uh, people quoting Derrida or uh, Foucault. Just because it gives them a certain sense of security. Okay, there either can't be wrong, or Foucault can't be wrong, or uh, Louis Montrose can't be wrong. Okay, all those great figures in uh, contemporary uh, or historical criticism, they can't be wrong. So, so if you quote from them, it gives you a certain kind of authority. Okay. So even there, and not uh, simply discussing a a novel or a play or a poem, but even in discussing um, critical works, even discussing theory, you have people uh, quoting endlessly and without a specific purpose. All right. Now, yeah, I think uh, this is what uh, I should have begun with plagiarism, the great uh, monster that people are scared of. Okay. So what exactly is plagiarism? Yeah, the simple explanation is you are using somebody's ideas as if they are 
your own. Yeah, see this as if, as if they are your own. That's plagiarism. Whereas if you quote from somebody, if you refer to somebody's uh, send a th theoretical formulation, it's in no way plagiarism. You see, okay, this is what I read in there is our Foucault or Louis Montrose or uh, Dolly Bond, Jonathan Dolly, whoever it is. Fine, no problem. But here again, uh, there is a peculiar issue. If you are paraphrasing people without mentioning them, that's happens quite often. Okay. So if you say the best way to look at uh, fiction is to think of uh, their historicizing uh, capacity and the, uh, what is it, what will you want to say? The fictionality of history, something without referring to Louis models. This is definitely plagiarism. Okay, it's well known, but uh, as a research scholar, you have to mention that this is from uh, Louis models. Okay, or if you talk about uh, what uh, Matthew Arnold said about Shelley, an ineffective angel beating in the luminous void. Uh, sorry, beating in the void, his luminous wings in vain. You can cleverly paraphrase this. Okay, you can leave out the angel and uh, use something else instead of paragon of virtue, for instance, or instead of beating uh, the wings, the luminous wings in the void, you can say uh, struggling in quicksand, whatever. You say. But people in the know. Certainly, if the referee is well read, he'll know that this is a paraphrased quotation from uh, Matthew Arnold. So, such clever uh, paraphrasing, camouflaging the original is also uh, definitely uh, plagiarism. Okay. So, the, the bad thing about plagiarism is the contemporary rules regarding the kind of software that you use to detect plagiarism okay uh, i think we use something called urkut urkunt uh, the accepted uh, software which is in use in university of calicut now let me tell you frankly i've drawn the attention of the university authorities to this it's a bad plagiarism why is it bad because it will simply uh, look at a quotation and uh, judge it as plagiarism so you have a, you even even if it is not judged plagiarism, you have a certain limit for the uh, number of quotations you can use, the percentage of quotations you can for each chapter. For certain chapters, thirty, you can have up to thirty percent quotations. Okay. For certain other chapters, less than ten, like that. And the most interesting thing is that its uh, database is very poor. I looked up, uh, I had a dissertation from Maulana Azad University, Hyderabad, to uh, evaluate. And I, right from the beginning, I suspected that large chunks had been lifted from somewhere. I tried Urkund, it didn't work. I went to the library, tried Urkund. Then the library very kindly told me that there are certain other uh, softwares. Ledgers and softwares, you can try those things. So I tried one, I picked up some how many? Uh, a dozen uh, instances of plagiarism. Not satisfied with that, I simply googled certain suspicious ones, and I discovered that uh, most of the dissertations, uh, dissertation was basically a rehashing of three texts, well-known texts. So I uh, went to them. I wrote to the uh, university that this, I, I, I can't this decision. And the interesting thing was she happened to be a Syrian refugee. Okay. So sympathy with refugees is one thing and dealing with plagiarism is another thing. I said, sorry. So it ended there. Okay. So so this is so plagiarism is this uh, the detecting plagiarism is problematic in this one. Even otherwise, if you if you if you write a thesis and you find uh, arguments of others in this instance I quoted right now. Uh, now, this particular uh, example would show that you can play, plagiarize in a very clever way. 
so that it's not discord but don't for a moment think that uh, if you are plagiarizing from an obscure text the referee may not be able to detect no not by a long shot because most of the books are now available online even those you don't suspect are available online so if you just google your uh, portion the portion of the text you get it as uh, simple as that so i've got it several times in one instance uh, as uh, i found that almost the entire thesis it was an mphil thesis was uh, lifted from two sources okay that's uh, there you are so that happened so i i am not i'm not saying that people uh, all everybody does that some people do that some a few people just a handful i would say to be honest uh, most of the research scholars are honest but what i'm trying to say is that plagiarism can be detected even without the aid of uh, plagiarism software so take translation for example i consider myself somewhat well i'm not boasting so if you if in a dissertation on translation if you try to plagiarize almost uh, most certainly i'll be able to detect it without referring to any uh, source either online or offline so there you are okay now let's move on yeah yeah um yeah this again uh, i think should have come somewhere in the beginning okay how many of you can type reasonably fast this is an off hand question uh how many of you give your material for other people to type so this is a skill which i have been trying to to make my students and research scholars cultivate for a long time so look at this uh, i am trying to yeah let me try to present i th i think okay uh i'll just type certain things Uh, am i allowed to present yes i am allowed to present yeah yeah this is this is the these are the notes i made okay okay i suppose you can see the screen okay no yeah, yeah. i am trying to type so yeah Fine. so you can see just starting yeah yeah, yeah. Okay, I think you have seen me type, right? Stop sharing. Okay, now uh, how many of you can type at this speed? This is a uh, is not a, a very fast uh, kind of uh, data entry that you found here. Uh, normally, I can type faster, but because I'm uh, speaking to you here, I'm trying. I'm using another window. I work slowly. Okay, so uh, you don't learn typing these days. When I was young, everybody, almost everybody, went for typing. I went at a very young age. Honestly, let me tell you, I went to a typing institute not to learn typing but to flirt with girls. This is a fact. But in any case, whether uh, whatever the objective uh, of going to learn typing, I found it useful later in life. Uh, at the age of twenty. I bought a, a portable typewriter, and I worked on it for more than 20 years before I switched on to a personal computer PC in 2004, more than two decades. The typewriter was is why I typed my thesis uh, on this typewriter, and later on uh, retyped it in a computer at a computer center uh, in when I was in Pondicherry, Karakal in Pondicherry. So I did it. I finished it uh, in. Good time. 
I used to work up to 11.30 or so at night. For I think uh, the whole thesis I finished in little more than a week, 10 days time. And then I, the advantage of uh, doing this is uh, you don't make mistakes. So if you read, if you proofread what other people have typed, there are uh, chances that a large number of typos, typos will remain on the page. So I remember this incident. That, was, that happened in 1988. One year after I did research at uh, uh, the Palayad Center of what was then Calicut University, and which is now Kannur University. So I use this word proscribed, P-R-O-S-C-R-I-B-E-D, meaning banned. So the typist, one uh, Mohan Atten, good friend of mine, he typed it as prescribed. So the word proscribed was fam not familiar to him. He read it as prescribed. I was talking about Dr. Zhivago, uh, the Louis Pasternak's famous novel, which was proscribed in the Soviet Union. So uh, Mohan Atten said exactly the opposite, which was prescribed in the Soviet Union. So fortunately, I saw that. So I corrected it with blade and pen. And it was uh, the original word was reinstalled, reinstated. So uh, it went to, for uh, refereeing. That was in my preliminary thesis. I left research afterwards, unfortunately. But this preliminary thesis I still have with me. So I, I value it as a somewhat uh, well written work. OK, so, I, uh, so this is what happens. Uh, if, if you don't uh, know word processing, word processing is definitely an important uh, skill that research scholars should cultivate. I don't think many have still acquired that skill. So earlier, as I said, uh, when people used to learn typing, OK, uh, we, we used to describe people's qualification as patanglasun typing. So this patanglasun typing was dissipated. All the typing institutions have been closed down. Fortunately, uh, some are uh, there using uh, computers, personal computers. The, the institute where I studied is still functioning with five uh, systems. So I was thankful. I went for a visit and found that it's still functioning. But even that's not necessary. You don't have to go to a typing institute. You can learn typing uh, by simply typing. Yeah, you learn typing by typing. And if you want instructions, you have such things like typing tutor or have the advanced form typing master which tells you which finger to use. There are a large number of people who are two finger uh, typists, yeah, using only your four fingers, which apart from uh, badly hurting your fingers, uh, your speed is seriously affected. Even type the people who type in offices. So this is one important lack, you know, with, I think the search scholars have to address. Okay, yeah. No, yeah, the style that you use, style manuals, okay, lots of uh, arguments, lots of, uh, I mean, disputes, right, such as what is the style that manual that you adopt. Normally, uh, most people uh, doing research in uh, languages and humanities approach uh, adopt the uh, modern language association style sheet, uh, guidelines for research scholars the eighth edition, which is the current edition. But remember that there are other uh, styles also. American uh, Psycholo uh, Psychologist Association, APA, Chicago Manual of Style. So some half a dozen style manuals you will find uh, on the net. Okay, most of the, all of them for uh, social sciences and uh, uh, languages. And I think the APA style is used in sciences also. So uh, you adopt a standard style of uh, writing. Uh, and this is mostly towards the uh, end of your research. Okay, The crux of the thing is what you write, how you write, uh, how, how you argue your case. Okay, This comes afterwards. So I suggest, uh, as a research, researcher and research scholar, that you uh, start worrying about this right at the end. The more important thing is uh, your source of research, uh, your arguments, uh, the validity of your arguments, how you have addressed your research question, etc. This is about uh, how you fashion. I, I don't think there is anything said about uh, style or diction in the narrow sense. Yeah, 
have said that in the beginning. But in documentation, yes, definitely, when you come to the end, how to document, uh, how to ref, uh, give your references, okay. uh, margins, etc. Uh, how to indent your quotations. For all these, you have uh, how to refer to uh, video or audio text. Okay, how to refer to films, how to refer to online material. This is a vast area, but uh, which you can uh, address at the end without worrying about them in the beginning. Of course, when you submit term papers, when you submit chapters, uh, your research supervisor will certainly ask you what happened to how, how did you, uh, why did you, why did you use footnotes? You could have used endnotes, etc. Okay, so okay, but my, my what I wanted to say besides uh, this is that even when you are doing your MA, you have a taste of this in your fourth sem uh, project, and of course for your uh, MPhil. So uh, I don't know if colleges insist on that, but if you uh, do such things like plagiarism, check right at the end of your MA, and for your MPhil. It will do a lot of good for research scholars because when they come to a PhD, they know that this is what they do or have to do. Okay, they've already had a taste of this. They've already have a, they already have a taste of uh, recognizing uh, style manuals. They have a taste of plagiarism. They all they have, they have seen all this when they come to PhD. So I think ideally that should be the thing. Okay, so one doesn't worry. One shouldn't worry about. Uh, writing manuals too much. That's my point. What is more important is your content of research. Okay. Uh, something else? Yeah. And uh, I think I should end with some uh, good news. What is that? The good news is that a research dissertation uh, need not be a record of your academic competence. Yeah. Okay. Saying uh, the opposite of what uh, many of you expected me to say, right? Because uh, this uh, the craze for acquiring PhDs uh, has become rampant because of uh, the fear that in a few years' time. You cannot become a teacher at a college or university without a PhD. This is a, this is a genuine fear. I don't, so so you have to acquire a PhD. But what I am trying to say is that there are hundreds of teachers in the country, thousands, who are very good scholars and who haven't thought of uh, acquiring a PhD last many years. Okay, so this is not a very uh, vague kind of assurance. If, if you are talking about uh, yourself as a scholar, as a good teacher, and of course not to speak about thousands of good teachers who have no PhDs, it's not it's not a, it's not a measure of your scholarship or even your creativity. Okay, if you, if you write a good novel, if you write a uh, collection of poems, if you write a play, if you write a review, or if you are, if you constantly if you write even if you uh, post good posts on social media. Uh, I think I think uh, you prove yourself as a good scholar or a very creative person. So, so what this means is that uh, PhD is an academic necessity. Okay, if I say a necessary evil, you'll quarrel with me. So I'm not saying this, uh, but uh, in my case, I don't think my PhD dissertation is the best work. I've been far from it. Okay. If you if you look at it, there might be some sparks of creativity in my PhD dissertation, but I don't. Occasionally, I refer to it. That's all. But apart from that, I don't think uh, my dissertation is uh, a, a measure of my creativity or competence as a teacher or a researcher or scholar. Okay, it just happened. Okay, so which doesn't mean that you neglect your uh, PhD. Okay. Once you are at it, you try to make it uh, the best possible you can. That's all. Okay. So, is there anything else? Let me see.
Yeah, I think I have uh, exhausted uh, those things which uh, I thought of saying. So uh, I can now leave the session open for questions. Okay, you can directly. I'm, I'm not a monster who frowns at questions. You can ask me any kind of questions. I don't mind uh, responding to them. I'm at your disposal now. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sheriff, sir, for that uh, insightful session. And I think uh, uh, one of the uh, best points, you brought together a lot of our concerns. And I think this craze for research that is there today is uh, the point that is there on everybody's minds. And of course, typing. And I think self-plagiarism is, uh, is the scariest version of plagiarism today, because we pay attention to everything else. But our ideas are spread all over papers that are published today, um, our own papers. So yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. The uh, forum is open to discussion. Uh, the participants uh, may send their queries uh, as messages in the chat boxes. I've kept my chat but before we go, yes, sir. But before we go into the uh, discussion, I think uh, Nisha Nam is here. And uh, yes, now that yes, we already yeah. know uh, Sheriff, sir, and the session, uh, Nisha Nam will be introducing the resource person for the take, Sheriff, sir, into a detailed uh, bio of Sheriff, sir. Nisha Nam, please. Thank you, Maya. Thank you. Good morning, all of you. And let me first start with a big apology for all the technical issues that occurred from my side. A big sorry to the resource person, the coordinators and participants who are attending this webinar from all sides of the globe. Most honorable keynote speaker of the day, Dr. K.M. Sharif, professor and head of the Department of English, Calicut University, respected principal, Dr. Sister Bina Jos, Vice Principal and IQAC Coordinator, Dr. Minimal K, IQAC Joint Coordinator, Ms. Maya Devi Chalisheri, the coordinating members of Research and Consultancy Cell of Vimla College, teachers, researchers, and students from various institutions attending this inaugural session of the Explorigate Research Webinar Series. A very warm good morning to all present here on this virtual platform. Let me at the outset appreciate and thank you for the overwhelming response we received from each one of you for our modest venture. Research is an academic journey or pursuit into the depths of knowledge, and a researcher will have to confront several baffling problems at the start and even during the course of his or her research journey. The webinars arranged under the Explorigate webinar series make an attempt to explore and investigate into the problems that confound the researcher. Sometimes, lack of scientific training in the methodology of research, academic dishonesty or plagiarism, lack of availability of resources, and even lack of confidence in taking up challenging concepts for an in-depth and serious study remain as hurdles in front of every researcher. Within the limitations and restrictions of this webinar imposed by the pandemic, we were able to arrange the platform for discussing various issues and problems that crop up normally during the adventurous journey of the researcher. Sharif sir has detailed on the issues in research during his session. Our speaker is an eminent scholar, a veteran research guide, a renowned translator, a polyglot, a meticulous researcher who even looked into the minute aspects of research like typing, word processing, who consoled us saying that PhD is only an academic necessity. Dr. Sherif, Associate Professor and Head, Department of English, University of Calicut, did his post-graduation from University of Calicut and PhD from the Veer Narmad Dakshin Gujarat University in Surat. He has a commendable teaching experience of 32 years in different colleges 
and universities across India. He has translated several works in English, Malayalam, Hindi, Gujarati, and Tamil. Dr. Sharif is perhaps known to all teachers who handle general English classes under the Calicut University. Yes, Sharif says, beautiful translation, Big Fish, is a chapter we teach in general English classrooms. He is currently the chairman of the PG Board of Studies English for the Calicut University. He was also the university nominee for the Board of Studies of the Department of English, Vimla College. He has published his published works include Kunya Patuma's Trees with Destiny, which is the first study in English of the works of Bepo Sultan, Waika Muhammad Bashir, Egalavyas with Thumbs, the first section of Gujarati Dalit writing in English, and Anne Frangende Almaratangal, the first collection of translation studies published as an audio book in Malayalam. He has scripted and anchored the first video on constructivist pedagogy at the tertiary level in India, which was produced by the Educational Multimedia Research Center, EMMRC, University of Calicut. His areas of interest are vast and varied. Apart from his interest in translation, he is also an expert in linguistics and pedagogy. Currently, he is a dynamic and vibrant head of the Department of English, University of Calicut. We are indeed very lucky to have him here today as, as a speaker of this session. Sir, on behalf of the IQAC and the Research and Consultancy Cell of Vimla College, and on behalf of all participants of this webinar, I extend a very warm and cordial welcome, as well as a big thanks to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. The staff and students of Vimla College are immensely proud of the young, energetic, and spirited head of the institution, our principal, Dr. Sister Bina Jose, who is recognized nationally and internationally with several awards and ac recognitions for her academic and administrative excellence. On behalf of the webinar organizing committee and the participants of the webinar, and with all due apologies for the hitches which happened earlier, I extend a very warm welcome to Sister Dr. Minimal K, the Vice Principal and IQAC Coordinator is a highly talented person teeming with innovative ideas. The seminar is the outcome of an ember that fell off from her ignited mind. She is supported by a team of enthusiastic teachers for coordinating this program. The young and energetic IQAC joint coordinator, Ms. Maya Devi, the members of Research and Consultancy Cell of Vimla College are all behind the success of this webinar. On behalf of all present for this webinar, I extend our gratitude to Dr. Minimol, Ms. Maya, and all members of Research and Consultancy Cell. This webinar became possible only because of the overwhelming response of its participants. Vimla College extends a very warm and cordial welcome, as well as a very big thanks to each one of you who are attending this webinar series. Thank you all. Thank you. Now the floor is open for discussion. I think many questions are appearing on the chat box. Uh, I now hand over the, the session to be handled by Ms. Maya. Thank you. Thank you, Nishama. Thank you for your words of welcome also. So, Sharif, sir, we go into the uh, questions that have come up. So, yeah, start um, with what I find on the screen here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, there's a question by, I think, Shamsi Krishnakumar. Uh, it's about publishing research articles related to uh, the research scholars PhD. Now, whether there will be an issue of salami slicing, as it is called, uh, I don't think it needs to be an issue because when you're publishing papers on your topic, in your research dissertation, you'll definitely refer to them. 
Okay, you'll quote from your own uh, text. I have written about this. So if that is done, I don't think there will be an issue. Because uh, writing a paper is your individual choice. You write a paper, you present it to the people. Doesn't mean that you can't use it. Okay. Only thing is if you are uh, reproducing it verbatim, if you are uh, reproducing large chunks of your paper without quoting, yeah, as if you are writing it for the first time, then of course there will be an issue of plagiarism. I don't think otherwise you need to be uh, scared of writing papers because that is what you're expected to do, plainly speaking. Because by the time you finish your PhD, ideally, you ought to have published at least half a dozen papers, ideally. Okay. You can always write. You can work on a particular area of uh, your uh, broad area that you have chosen. Okay, You can write a paper on it. You can get it. And that actually helps you in your research. Because you have done some work on that. You only have to do is to look back at it. Okay, Bring those arguments which you used in the paper into your decision. All these are fine. I don't think there ought to be any problem. Although uh, some research scholars, supervisors scare research scholars on this. I never did uh, do this to my research scholars. They freely publish papers. I, I, they haven't had a problem as far as I'm aware. OK. Now, uh, there is another one which appears here. I'll start from the top. Uh, tertiary sources. Yeah, this is by Dr. Suman Deebak Munko. Uh, can uh, can you give some more examples of tertiary sources? So tertiary sources are simply indices, encyclopedias, um, bibliographical. Uh, com, com, compilations, which give you a, a, a compilation, a, a bibliography, large uh, bibliographical compilation, for example, which gives you, for example, uh, this you can have some some for dissertations. Yeah, that's also a tertiary resource. And I think uh, what is it called? Yeah, Shodh Ganga. Yes, Shodh Ganga. I think is a tertiary resource. Although I don't know if you can get whole dissertations from Shodhgan. Shodhgan is a good example of uh, tertiary resource. So there are many such sources. Okay, and indirectly, okay, I don't know if it is if I can say that the net itself is a tertiary resource. Okay, can say. But uh, as a tertiary resource, it not only gives you uh, the um, indices but it can also give you the whole work okay you can get novels you can download novels or poems from the net so the net is another kind of source okay which uh, may function as a tertiary source okay but one doesn't have a good description for it. what kind of source uh, you can call net okay so that can be called but it functions as a tertiary source sometimes as in this case of uh, giving you uh, all these online all right yeah you how, how to choose a journal and what should be done if our paper is rejected simple send it to another journal yeah some journals reject but uh, such scholars as they go along they become uh, very familiar with uh, the uh, kind of tactics that you employ looking at certain journals, decide what kind of journals, what kind of papers will be accepted, even going to the extent of analyzing the psychological makeup of the uh, editor. That also happens. Some business scholars are very clever at that. They think over the uh, psychological makeup of the uh, editor, if it's somehow familiar, OK, and decide whether this paper will be accepted. All these are fine. So ideally, choose your journal wisely. Okay, uh, may, may kind of think over uh, the fact, uh, think over the possibility of your paper getting published in a journal. That happens. Many many scholars succeed actually. Okay, or even make inquiries. Why not? Whether uh, there is a special coming up, whether uh, the journal will accept uh, the kind of topics you are working on, etc. Et okay. Uh, then, 
Yeah, this is uh, Shamsi Krishnova's question I've answered. Uh, aspects of literature review in this. Yeah, why not? People use them all the time. So in JSTOR, for example, the uh, in Calicut University, I think you can get papers and reviews from JSTOR free. If you, if you are a research scholar, you'll be given an ID. You can download these videos. And some reviews are very good. Okay. Take recently, I came across a good review of Andre Lefebvre's famous essay, Translating Poetry, Seven Strategies and a Blueprint. One of his most well-read uh, essays. So there's a good review of this, telling you what this essay basically contains, how it approaches translating poetry, etc. So reviews are definitely useful. You don't have to go for full-blooded critical articles. Not necessary. Reviews are good enough. Hundreds of good reviews appear every day. People who have read the book, and, and I think a good review is like a good class. Okay. Think of uh, Ian McEwen's famous novel, Amsterdam. So uh, I remember that was one of my best classes, as far as I can remember, because I liked the novel immensely, how it dealt with the media and all those things. So I uh, I prepared well and took a class. Unfortunately, I haven't recorded it. Uh, recording was not so popular in those days. That there you are. So a review is definitely a good material for us. Uh, yeah, plagiarism I have already. I mean, Krishna's question here. Self plagiarism. Okay. Self. There's no self plagiarism. Yeah. Sir, I think uh, there are queries also. Shraddha Saroj Imam has asked how to choose a journal and what should be done if our paper is rejected. Yeah, I, I have answered this question. Okay, uh, okay, okay. Came here. I have answered that question. Uh, how to choose a journal? I have answered that question. I said that if you send a paper okay. to a journal and it gets rejected, you have to send again. But then you have to choose wisely which journal right, right. to send you. I have answered that question already. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, then, is it possible for us to do medical humanities? Yeah, there is a research going on. I don't know if it is finished at uh, Kerala or Mahabharata on medical fiction. Is is it what is meant here in this question? Medical humanities. How uh, how uh, or is it about medical research and its uh, repercussions on the public. I didn't understand the question properly. Can the person uh, come uh, alive on the mic? Gopinath. Gopinath, sir. Uh, is it possible to for us to do medical humanities? That was the question. So is it about fiction on or other kinds of writing on medical issues. Sir, good morning, sir. Ah, yes. Sir, I'm Gopinath from Tamil Nadu, sir. Ah, what was the question? Sir, I want to, uh, re, uh, because I know that medical humanities is a emerging field, I wanted to PhD on medical ah. humanities, like medical narratives. So, ah. Ah. Uh, I want to ask whether it is possible for us to, to choose some literary works uh, based uh, uh, in yeah, the light of medical humanities. Yeah. I think I understood your question right. That's what I said in the yes. beginning. There is a yes, research, uh, there is a research going on at yes, Kerala Arma College, Trishur, okay, okay, which sir. is about which is about fiction on medical issues. Oh, Robin sir. Cook, all those people who wrote on uh, medical issues, coma. Oh. Uh, oh. I don't know if she has taken Robin Cook as one of the authors, but she's definitely working on this area. Definitely, you can do. But the problem is that in many research institutions, research supervisors are wary of accepting innovative proposals. Yeah. So it depends upon how uh, flexible your research center is. If your research center is flexible, I don't, th I don't think of any reason why it's not possible. It ought to be possible. It's a very okay, valid sir. area of research. Okay. Okay, sir. Ah. Sir, yeah. thank you, sir. Thank you for typing my tape. Okay. Uh, what else? Uh, tertiary sources. 
plagiarism. Yeah, this is by Anne Mary. Could you suggest some points to remember before publishing a paper in a book? Ah, yes. Yeah. Many, many students and scholars ask me this question. The only thing I can say is that uh, when it's a paper, there's a peculiar format to it. Okay. When it becomes a chapter in a book, it changes its slightly. <laughs> and if you are using this as a chapter uh, in a book, uh, you have written yourself. There again, there will be a difference. So, even turning your dissertation into a book, I, I don't think many students or research scholars are doing it. They want to do it. If you think your dissertation is a valuable document, I think uh, definitely you should turn it into a book. I have given this advice to at least half a dozen uh, research scholars at least sometimes. To some uh, research scholars whose uh, dissertations are evaluated, Definitely, I asked them to uh, make a book of their decision because it will be available to more people. It will definitely make you more famous as a writer. The only thing is that there are slightly different formats. Uh, with, uh, there are differences between a paper which appears in a journal and the same content reformulated as a chapter in a book. Either your own book or somebody else's book. Yeah as one of the essays, articles. Okay. So it changes. If it is somebody else's uh, collection, as some, it is somebody else's book, a book edited by somebody else, uh, probably there won't be much changes expected. But if you are making it part of a book, you are writing yourself, then of course, the more changes will be required. Go, go for that. Uh, anything else? Yeah, there's time for some more questions. Uh, you can either raise them directly. I'm waiting. Participants may type in their queries in yeah. the chat box. You can either come live on the mic or come or you can live. Type your Meanwhile, somebody typed that my song was good. Thank you. So, definitely, I didn't say it so far. Sir, uh, there's a question in the chat box. Uh, Amal Dev, sir, has asked, while translating something, I couldn't find an apt word for an open access journal in Malayalam. Can you help me out? Where is it? At the top? Or just post no, sir. At, uh, below, below. Towards the end. Towards the end. Okay. Ah, open access journal. OK. Uh, Open access journal. You can have a word like uh, Sodandra. Uh, I think what you mean is something that anybody can see. Is it an online journal? Open access journal. You can use it. You can use uh, such things like Sodandra. Uh, journal or uh, what else it's a technical term probably a term is not yet uh, arrived in Malayalam I'll check it up anyway for example even for free software Linux the term used is Sodandra software since that you are free to access it Probably you can try that. 
Yes, okay. sir. Thank you, sir. Sir, Shraddha Saroj ma'am has asked, uh, again, in case we don't get the expected results, what should be done? What uh, can, the, can the question uh, be the, amplified? Uh, yes. That's what Shraddha ma'am, there's a little bit of uh, vagueness in the question. Can you amplify that? Yes. Shraddha Saroj. I think Shraddha Ma'am is typing out the question. Oh, yeah, I'm watching it. In detail. <laughs> Meanwhile, I tried to answer this by Jackson David. When we do a quantitative research, how many respondents are needed? And for a qualitative res research, how many respondents are required? Uh, I don't think there is any limit set for either. Okay, it must be viable, that's all. <clears throat> so, for instance, if you are working on a topic like the effects of the paradigm shift in secondary education in Kerala post 2007, generally you expect the number of respondents to be more because there are a number of stakeholders, teachers, students, uh, employers, and it's something that was implemented across the state. Okay, so definitely you need more respondents. On the other hand, if you are looking at uh, something like, uh, what shall I say? Uh, yeah, the, uh, the, uh, emergence of uh, a shift towards uh, public education in Thiruvanthapuram district, let us say. You're doing this uh, in part of uh, language teaching. Now, there, of course, the, the area, hinterland is small. How many respondents do you need? You need a cross-section of the teachers and students from the district. Naturally, your number would be less. That's all. So there is no prescribed number for anything. Okay, depending upon your the size of your uh, the area in the land of your research, the uh, the magnitude of your research problem, etc. No fixed number of uh, respondents. Okay. Okay. Yeah, there is a. Uh, yeah, there is this request from Sumi TP, who has uh, come online. Uh, she has typed, uh, I did register, but didn't receive the link for the meet. So kindly, please note my mail ID. Okay, I think. Uh, sir, it's ID done, sir. Sir, it's done. Okay. It's done. Okay. It has been noted. Uh, Shraddha Saraj's question has come. Being a nutrition research scholar, I tried to develop food products that can address malnutrition but uh, at the end i in ca in case i am unable to fulfill the nutritional criteria as i expected then how to fix it you can't fix it i think fixing uh, if it is used in the derogatory sense uh, you are trying to develop a food products that can address malnutrition okay so if you if you research if you fail to it you have to confess your failure. You can't fix it. How can you fix it? You are, if you try to it and you can you can probably you can give the results as your I mean you tried various combinations permutations and combinations but failed to arrive at something which would give uh, which can be given as nutritional supplement. That's all. I don't think people can fix it. Okay. Try to find something, you don't find it. Then in your research itself, you state that these are the things that you did, but you couldn't arrive at a final uh, solution. But I don't think it will any research will come to that. Some nutrition is not a difficult area. I don't think it is, as far as I know. Okay. Thank you, sir. So uh, we are nearing the conclusion of today's session. 
to propose a vote of thanks, so may I please invite Meera K, Research Scholar, Department of English. Meera, over to you. Hello. Hello. Am yes, I audible? You're audible? Yes, you're audible. Please continue. Uh, Namaskar and good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'm conscious of the fact that we have uh, come to the fag end of the inaugural lecture, and I promise not to take more than three minutes of your time. So let me straight away hop on to the task at hand. At the outset, uh, we would like to earnestly thank our resource person, Dr. K. M. Sharif, for uh, explore, for inaugurating the Exploregate Research Webinar Series by exploring a very pertinent topic from uh, delineating the sources of research, the style of writing, the size of thesis, the pitfall of plagiarism, to delivering the piece of good news at the end. Uh, the observations were all pragmatic, with bits of folk song, personal anecdotes. The session was absolutely engaging. So thank you again, sir, for sparing your time and for letting us pick your brain. Uh, we are indebted to our beloved principal, Dr. Sister Bina Josh who zealously champions such uh, scholarly deliberations and offers us rock-solid support. The webinar lecture series has been organized by the IQAC and a Research and Consultancy Cell of Vimla College, the two integral organs of the institution that consistently work to keep the body of knowledge hale and healthy. We are grateful to the coordinators of this virtual event, Dr. Minimal K. Josh, who is our vice principal, a coordinator of IQAC, a perfectionist who shoulders responsibilities with much ease and grace, and Ms. Maya Devi Chalisheri, uh, who is also a joint coordinator of IQAC, a diligent multitasker whose enthusiasm is just contagious. In fact, uh, Exploregate has been sculpted through the uh, dedicated efforts of a proactive team, uh, including uh, nine departments of the college. So we would like to thank them all for their uh, steadfast commitment to this initiative. This particular inaugural lecture has been put together by the Department of English. A word of thanks to the head of the Department of English, uh, Dr. Nisha Francis Alapat, whose meticulous approach and ability to stay calm and navigate through challenges are evident today. Uh, in fact, we would like to thank all the uh, speakers. We have eight more sessions to come. All the proficient speakers who have consented to be a part of this event, we would like to thank them all in advance. And undoubtedly, the life and blood of this uh, academic exercise is our uh, online audience. We thank you, our uh, dearest participants, for showing keen interest in this exercise. In fact, uh, your interaction, your active interaction, brought back the human element in these almost post-humanist uh, technology-driven times. And to all those who have in one way or other um, contributed to the conception and execution of this uh, event, May I use the words of William Shakespeare from Twelfth Night? I can no other answer make, but thanks and thanks and ever thanks. Thank you all again. Have a good day. Thank you, you, Mira. Maya. Thank you, Mira, for your warm words. You put into words exactly the sentiments of the entire group present online. So thank you. Thank you very much. Once again, in one word, huge uh, words, uh, huge warm gratitude to our respective principal, Dr. Sister Bina Jose, the IQAC coordinator, Dr. Minimol, uh, the NAC coordinator, Dr. Malini, the entire team of the research and consultancy cell, the IQAC team, and of course, the guest of honor for the day, Dr. Sheriff. Thank you, one and all. We conclude the meeting. Thank you. Thank you.